Wilfred Owen was an English poet, and he was writing poetry from the the war front um, in World War One, and uh, so he fought, I think, on the Western Front. And um, in 1917, he was hospitalised in Edinburgh. He had shell shock, and uh, at that time, he began writing poetry. Um, and his purpose was to show the reality of war, and that conflicted with the the uh, propaganda and the, the government line. Um, in 1918, he returned to the, the front and, and uh, was actually killed in battle a week before the armistice. Now, the poem, uh, its title, Dolce e Decorum Est, is um, a reference to a Horace poem. Horace was a, a Roman poet um, in ancient Rome, and it's Latin, it's a Latin title. And if I skip down to the bottom, uh, Dolce Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori, that means um, that it is sweet and right to die for one's country, for your country. So um, really the, the, um, the title is a very sarcastic um, sort of statement and it, it is challenging the, the dominant narrative of war, that being that, that um, it's a, a noble thing to fight for your country and that the soldiers who, who uh, sacrifice their lives in war are, um, are honourable characters. So the first stanza begins with uh, a really vivid picture of what life is like on the, on the battlefront. And uh, so imagery is used quite um, effectively to show the soldiers, you know, bent over. They're absolutely exhausted. We see that that um, they're they're walking along like their their beggars under sacks. So that it's, that's really um, highlighting the absolute fatigue in which they they're, they're um, finding themselves. They're knock kneed, coughing like hags. We curse through sludge. So in the opening two lines, we, um, we are exposed to a completely different uh, picture of war. Remember in World War I, propaganda was uh, used by the government and by the military to uh, present an image of war, and this certainly um, counteracts that and it, it challenges that, that um, sanitised view of war. Look at that verb there. Not only did they walk through, but they they cursed through sludge. Uh, the The Western Front battles were uh, known for the um, extreme um, muddy conditions that that were the result of trench warfare, but also from um, the extreme amounts of rain as well. So these soldiers are uh, sort of probably walking knee deep in mud, and uh, you know it's it's incredibly exhausting. It says, so they're walking along till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. So the flares go up, which would be a, a, a signal, a semaphore uh, for the soldiers to turn around and march back in the, the other direction. So it really shows the futility of what they're doing, um, that there seemed to be no purpose, uh, no real objective to what they were doing. Men marched asleep. We have this very short, it's called a truncated sentence, um, and it, it highlights once again the absolute fatigue that, that um, soldiers experience because of the, um, the, um, you know, the long periods of time that they'd been in these conditions. Many lost their boots but limped on bloodshod. All went li lame, all blind. So here were the... Um, Owen is comparing the soldiers marching along like cattle off to slaughter. They were drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of disappointed shells that dropped behind. So this is a reference to, um, you know, the shell shock um, that, that many soldiers experience. But I think it's saying that they're, they're, they're basically walking souls. They, they aren't humans anymore and that... Even with shells um, dropping all around them, they've been desensitised to that because of their fatigue. 
you know, they're expecting to die, and, um, and so it's not really having any bearing or impact on them. Now, gas was uh, used first in about 1915 in World War One. It was a new, it was a modern uh, technology, a modern uh, form of, of um, military uh, attack. And um, so here we see that um, the we, we capture the the intensity of the the uh, the panic that the the soldiers are experiencing there through the pace quickening. And notice that it's boys, you know, which is really um, a colloquial expression, but it, it is sort of um, just emphasising that many of the soldiers were um, at best 18 years of age, um, so very young and um, really, really only children being exposed to such horrors. Um, okay, and so then we get a description of the fitting of the, the gas mask and this ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. So the, the, the poet, uh, the, the persona of the poem, is um, watching someone who's um, panicking so much that they, they don't put their, their gas mask on in time. And, and so they're, they're floundering, which is a really nice um, image there, I think. Dim through the misty panes and the thick green light, so that's the, um, you know, the, the gas mask had a, a green sort of glass in there, the goggles, and could also reference the, the colour of the gas that's drifting across the, the, um, the field as well. But, um, and it says, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. So um, he's using another simile here to say that it's like um, once you put that helmet on, you're, you're underwater and um, sort of in your own little bubble, and um, and he he watched uh, a man suffocate to death, and he uses the term drowning um, because it shows that he's out of his depth and and there's nothing he can do to save himself, but he's really um, I suppose the, the gas hitting his lungs um, causes him to 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 choke and probably probably um, have the similar effect to drowning so it's quite quite um, confronting now we have a little gap and let's see how many lines we've had so far one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen so some people see this as a sonnet and there are another 14 lines below um, so some people will argue that the poem is um, written in the form of uh, two sonnets um, and maybe we can say that we, we do see a shift here from um, pretty much third person. Um, uh, you know, I've got, I saw him drowning, but, you know, it's observational. And then we start to, to move into a more personal uh, uh, approach to the topic. So in all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. So we've got those listing of verbs here that, that really reveal the the horror of watching this poor young man, um, you know, desperate for help, trying to try to uh, be able to breathe, and and uh, it has such a horrific impact on on the poet that that um, it, it haunts him. And then we have uh, a real shift in in um, person here. So um, there's a bit of first person, but it's essentially the majority of third person, but. Here the, the persona speaks directly to you, the reader. And if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the wide eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer and bitter as the cud, and then it says down here, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest the children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie that it's sweet and noble to die for in this country. So here the, um, the, the poet is talking directly to his audience, which would be the uh, people of England at the time. There were many, many people in England who were pro-war and, um, you know, due to the propaganda, and the censorship, they, they weren't really aware of what war 
was actually like. Men who uh, refused to fight were often imprisoned, uh, and any conscientious objectors or, um, or people who spoke out against the war effort um, often would receive a white letter in their, in their um, post or um, left on their doorstep, uh, which was, you know, to, to uh, blame them of cowardice. And so Owen's purpose is to tell the people at home, those who are not actually experiencing the war firsthand, is to give them a really vivid impression. And here he challenges them and says, if you saw what I saw, you would not tell your children these romantic dreams of war. There's some really interesting um, images that he creates here. So we see the absolute horror and the desperation um, um, as we're given a, a clear depiction of him suffocating. Um, and he's hanging face like a devil sick of sin. So even the devil, uh, it's, you know, he's so, um, the expression on his face was so horrific, even, um, it, it would even be worse than the devil who was at the point of, of um, exhaustion as well. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. And so here is the, the reality of the gas and the impact on him. And that's why he's saying up here that he's drowning because, um, you know, the, 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 bu the bubbles of fluid would, would stop him from being able to, to breathe. And essentially he's drowning. Okay, um, obscene as cancer was horrible to look at. Bitter as the cud, which is, you know, the, when the cow chews on grass and swallows it and then they regurgitate it. So it's a really vile, grotesque sort of image there. Um, you know, so he, re he reinforces that. And then we have this, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest. So, um, you know, I suppose that's really emphasising he's talking to his countrymen and, um, and that he's saying that you would not tell children these glorified romantic images of war if you'd seen the reality, okay, and he calls it the old lie. So this is the government propaganda, the, um, the notion uh, from the government and the army that it's an honourable thing to serve your country and it's, it's very noble and uh, it's, it's, a, um, uh, a, a, um, you know, it's a duty to, to um, fight and die for your country. And so he, he ends with that dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, um, which has a really um, strong pessimistic tone to it. It's very confronting in, in what he's saying and um, he effectively um, positions the reader to think about war from a different perspective. So rather than hearing the, the dominant narrative, the grand narrative of war, that it's, it's a, a noble and, and it's a necessary thing to defeat evil, the soldier's perspective here is a, um, a marginalised voice. And, um, and we know that soldiers who wrote letters on the front, uh, they were redacted quite significantly. Or anything that was controversial was blacked out. So poetry was the, the means by which uh, the truth could be revealed.